Hello and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show, episode number 16, and we are delighted to be sharing with you sunrise and sunset tips and techniques from our Landscape Photography theme page curators. This is going to be an absolutely a fun show, and um, I'm going to introduce some of our panel members here. We'll start with the head curator of landscape photography, Margaret Tompkins. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Margaret Tompkins from Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm an amateur uh, photographer, uh, retired professionally, so now I enjoy taking pretty pictures of pretty scenery and um, love uh, curating the landscape photography theme, so glad to be with you this evening. Okay. Now we're going to run over to California here and meet Tom Harrell. Hello, thank you, Kara. My name is Tom Harrell, and I'm an amateur photographer based in Carmel, California, and I'm also a curator on the theme. I enjoyed interacting with everyone that contributes to the, to, to the theme. Thank you. Great. Now we're going to go into the middle of the U.S. Kevin. <laughs> oh, I'm in the middle of the U.S., okay. Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe west. Yeah. Middle west. west. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in South Jordan, Utah. So um, photography is not my main job. It is a hobby, but I am very passionate about it. And there's a few places you can find me. Um, you can find me on Facebook at... Kevin Rowe Photo, facebook.com slash Kevin Rowe Photo. I'm one of the curators for the landscape photography theme, and I'm the owner of the uh, Utah Photographers page. And if you have any pictures uh, of Utah you want to share, we'd love to have you there. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Now we're going to go to the hot spot, <laughs> Jim Worthman. <laughs> Thanks, Cara. Uh, my name's Jim Worthman. I'm also an amateur photographer, and... I really enjoy shooting landscapes, living in Phoenix, Arizona. We've got a lot of great possibilities here. I do color and black and white, and I enjoy curating in the landscape photography theme. Thanks, Jim. And now we're going to go up north. Jeff. Good evening, everyone. I'd first like to say I'm extremely impressed and even amazed at the quality of the photos that were submitted yeah. to this event site and uh, want to congratulate and thank everybody who's participating that's the kind of thing that really keeps this uh, show interesting um, I'm a amateur photographer retired I've had some professional experience in the past but I do it on my own dime now and uh, since I don't have mountains and oceans to photograph I uh, get as much interest out of the local rivers as I can and <laughs> you'll see some of that tonight and uh, thank you and welcome great well thank you all and I'm Cara Riley I'm a small business and real estate consultant and founder of the photo tour global directory website and a passionate photographer thanks to Margaret Tompkins and her kind uh, remarks uh, from landscape photography and tonight we are having a, an exciting evening with a show starter um, all of you that have participated in the landscape photography show sunrise sunset event and like Jeff said just an incredible bunch of photographers sharing the most amazing shots and we want to thank each and every one of you and just like American Idol or the uh, voice you know we have a hard time figuring out which one is the best so uh, we um, are going to share with you one show starter that was selected and the good news is that everyone who has participated we are going to have a circle of sunrise sunset uh, participants and so we'll be sharing that too and we want to thank you so much and I'm going to go right to Jeff's uh, screen here and uh, or um, Kevin's screen and we'll show you our uh, two of our show starters yeah so so real quick Cara we had the tie so we voted as curators and we had a tie so we've got two of them and this is, and I hope I'm saying your name right, it's uh, Malia, and 
I really love this photo. Um, just a awesome reflection. The snow with the pink colors really stood out. The other one here is Kai. You say it, Jim. Kosonen. There you go. Sounds good. Okay, so we have our show starters, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. And did, uh, did we have some other comments here that anybody wanted to say anything? Uh, just excellent choices. That uh, first one, I just uh, love the reflections. I'm I'm just a sucker for reflections like that, where you've got the trees and the, the color. Gorgeous shot. They're, they're amazing shots. Definitely. Yeah, on Kai's, I mean, I really love the leading lines, strong foreground, and uh, the kind of slow water. Just a beautiful uh, composition. So, yes, I, I'll say I like the Kai's, too. Um, living near the ocean, I particularly like the ocean sunsets and appreciate how hard it is. And uh, I like the full capture of the range of um, tone and, and the slow water as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, and thank you so much. We will have uh, in our photographers to watch both of these show starters, um, and you will have a link to see some of their other beautiful work. And uh, so here we are going into, you're going to have fun watching the panel members share five to ten minutes of how they prepare for sunrise or sunset and some of the things that have worked um, for them. And so we're going to start with uh, Jim Worthman, going to tell us about preparing for a sunrise shoot. Thanks, Cara. Yeah, so it was interesting preparing for tonight's show because for some reason the other panelists just weren't real warmed up to the idea of sunrise. So I volunteered, and, and I thought maybe it had something to do with that 3 a.m. getting up thing, but I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm going to step through the planning process and uh, show you some photos from one particular shoot. And uh, what we'll be talking about tonight is, is, a sh is a shot at Mesa Arch in Canyonlands. Uh, it's a beautiful arch, and especially at sunrise. This example was from a few years ago on December 31st. Now, the sun rises uh, later in December, so I didn't have to get up quite so early in the northern hemisphere. Okay? Um, so let me s share the screen. And we'll start with just getting an idea of where we're talking about. And here you can see... A um, uh, vertical line separates uh, is the boundary between Colorado and Utah, Interstate 70 going east to west or west to east, um, and you see Arches National Park, Moab, which has got the little uh, green stick pin, and uh, then uh, Canyonlands uh, down to the south, and the location of this particular arch is noted by B. So you can see the route there also between, between the two. Um, so the question is, how early do we have to get up? And for that, I like to use the Photographer's Ephemeris, or TPE. Um, and what, what this shows you is, again, the stick pin is sitting right pretty much where Mesa Arch is. And you can see the lines representing uh, sunrise and sunset, moonrise and moonset direction or angles. But importantly, December 31st, you can see the sun rises at 7.37 a.m. And uh, I guess I, I'd point out at summer solstice in June, that backs up an hour and a half, so it's 6 a.m. in June. So good, good that I was doing this in December. So um, like I mentioned, we want the sun coming up as far south as possible. You'll see why in a minute. And also on TP, off on the right, you can see the angle. And what, what you see is that the angle is decreasing. What that means is day by day, this yellow line is moving to the north. So once you pass winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, this line kind of starts moving back up. So you can see all that on TPE. Um, now, uh, this, uh, this is a fairly popular spot. So the sun, sun comes up at 7.37. Um, I'd like to get there about 6.45, OK? So we'll try uh, another Google map. And, and if I want to be there at 
um, 645, uh, according to Google, it's a one-hour drive, and that's pretty accurate. There's a short hike, five or ten minute hike, once you park. So uh, to leave a little margin, we'll leave the hotel at 5.30 in the morning. And again, if this were the, the summertime, that'd be closer to 3.45 a.m. I think I'm getting why most of the panelists didn't want to go there. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so why would we go to all this trouble, get up early uh, in the freezing cold? It, it's to get a shot like this. And I like to get there early to get a few shots during nautical twilight. Um, this particular one is 40 minutes before sunrise. And uh, one thing to note is you get in there early and it's really, really cold, at least it was this day. So you'll be standing around a lot. You, you really need to be sure to dress warm, and I recommend hand warmers. Um, there were a lot of numb fingers <laughs> on this particular day. This shot is at 17 millimeters, by the way. Um, so let's see, moving on uh, to the next shot, and this is still about a half hour before sunrise. Uh, the light you can see is nice and soft. Um, this is a good time to decide which lens you're going to be using. Because when the light is getting to be peak and, and it'll move fast once, once the sun comes up, that's a really bad time to be changing lenses. So unless you know, you're carrying more than one camera, you've you got to decide which lens you're going to shoot during the, the best light. And I was using here a 17 to 35 f2.8. And uh, you'll see later I switch. But I just stuck with that lens for, for uh, the early part. This one was 27 millimeters. And here you can see canyons in the distance that are carved by the Colorado River. And you can see a formation toward the center called the Washerwoman. And we'll see some, some closer uh, shots of, of the Washerwoman here in a minute. Um, so just at sunrise, and this was 7.40 AM, so TPE was pretty close, uh, especially given elevation changes and all that. And you can see the sun uh, making a nice starburst right at the horizon. And also you notice that the light is starting to illuminate the bottom, the underside of the arch. Um, and that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Now, one of the things, I mentioned shooting this um, uh, as close to the winter solstice as you can, because the sun, in this, in this view, we're looking pretty much east. And the sun is kind of down to the southeast. If this were in the summertime, with this same composition, the sun would be coming up like over the mountains. It, it, it's not nearly as balanced, not, not as nice a composition, I think. And don't get me wrong, you can get nice compositions any time of the year, but if you want the sun off to one edge of the arch, definitely go in December. Okay? Now, um, here's another one, uh, four minutes after the sun rises. And again, the light's changing fast. I, I'm doing a lot of recomposing and shooting and trying to get a lot of different shots. And then afterwards, you figure out you know, which one worked the best. Um, and I would say, for me, when I think about that, this is my favorite out of the entire day. And uh, this was uh, 12 minutes after the sunrise. 23 millimeter uh, focal length, and again, you can see the, the sun just starting to cross the edge of the arch, so you get that nice sunburst. And uh, you can see the nice dusting of snow down in the valley. Um, it's, it's certainly my favorite shot. 22 minutes after the sunrise, and again, I'm moving around trying different angles and different compositions, um, some with snow in the foreground, this was, let's see, this was 26 millimeters. And then 30 minutes after the sunrise. Now here I've switched lenses to the 24 to 70 f2.8. And I did that so that I could get, you know, some closer shots. This one's the washerwoman again. And you can see this pretty well. You see the, the formation it looks like a woman, you know, leaning over and in theory doing her, her laundry. Uh, but the sun is still uh, at such an angle that it's still lighting up the bottom of the arch. Okay, and 35 minutes after sunrise, and this one's at 42 millimeters. And here, again, looking for unusual angles. This is 45 minutes after the sunrise with the 24 millimeters, and um, 
one thing to remember is anytime you're out, yeah, you know which direction to look to get the iconic shots, but look around. Do a 360 once or twice, and you'll be amazed at what else you might see that it's like, oh, I didn't know that, and you'll be the only one to get that shot, maybe. Um, and, and definitely walk around the, the, the area and, uh, and you know, see, see what else you can get. Do we have some questions for Jim? Yes, we have one from Crystal Craft. Jim, that the one that you said you liked the best, she had posted a picture in black and white because the color didn't come out right. Can you talk about the filters or what you did so that the color came through? Well, and her, uh, her question is specifically um, shooting straight into the sun like that, so your sun yes. star. Yeah, um, and so the sun star, a couple things. I think you have the best luck when the sun is starting to cross over an edge, like the horizon when it first rises, or the edge of the arch in this case. And also, I think uh, it's best to stop down. I think because if it's wide open, you're less likely to get the sun star. And I didn't use, uh, well, I may have used a polarizer. I don't remember. But I, I usually will use a polarizer, and, and that's all. Um, and uh, I will say that. Uh, you have to be really careful about lens flare. So any filters I use, I try to get them multi-coated and all of that to try to keep down the lens flare. You still get some. If you look closely at some of these, you'll see some lens flare, um, the ones that are going straight into the sun. But good question. <laughs> so, um, OK. Um, uh, just real quick, I, I think just to reiterate that, you really want to stop down like f18, f22 to get a good sun star. Do you find that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, moving on, and and you're in this beautiful place. You've taken a lot of time and effort to get there, and so it, you may as well go other places, even though the light isn't great, and and just take some more shots. And this one was uh, 45 millimeters uh, nearby, and this one was also nearby. This is actually from Dead Horse Point. Um, State Park, but it's it's pretty near uh, Mesa Arch, and uh, uh, just you know make the best of it. Even when the light isn't great, you can still get some great photography. And that's it for me. Hi, oh, Chuck. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. That was awesome. Thanks. So now we're going to go right over here to Margaret, and she's going to be sharing about that bird's eye view going around the sun and getting those extra shots. Okay, let's see if I can get the screen share here. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Nice. Are you seeing that? See that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is Monument Valley, and um, uh, it's the only photograph I'm going to show, just this one. So, uh, kind of point out a couple of things about it. Um, in the foreground are the uh, very famous Ansel Adams rocks. So, if you're into black and white photography and have studied um, some of the great masters like Ansel Adams, uh, you have seen these two rocks before. They haven't moved them. Uh, they are uh, very much a prominent fixture. And this view is right next to the parking lot of the View Motel that is there now. So uh, this is wheelchair accessible. Uh, anybody um, that has their walker or whatever can get to this location. So it's certainly a stunning place. And it uh, sets up above the valley just a bit. Uh, the two buttes that you see in the background are the mittens. Um, you see the uh, left mitten and the right mitten, and you can probably tell how they get their names there. So these are two famous um, buttes that are in Monument Valley, and you can see from the shadows there that the sun is just very near uh, setting and um, uh, just in uh, incredible color. Uh, that popped out on the buttes there, especially the left mitten. Uh, that's one of my favorite uh, colors there. And as striking as this photograph was, the really pretty one was directly behind me. 
and unfortunately uh, in the foreground right behind me was that big parking lot uh, there at the motel so it didn't have anything pretty to anchor it so I didn't even take a shot of it but the clouds uh, the sun was just lighting them up it was uh, incredible oranges and pinks and that was directly behind me so my uh, tip to everyone is don't just shoot straight in front of you even though it may be an incredible sight look to your right and left 90 degrees often you will see something that is just lit up whether it's a bush or a tree uh, but you can have incredible shots there and I I think Jim mentioned that you want to walk around try to get as much as you possibly can and look directly behind you often uh, maybe the most striking image will be one that uh, is just uh, 180 degrees uh, behind you so take a look that, that's my advice for this evening and back to you Cara well, thank you, Margaret. And um, I'm going to be sharing my screen here with uh, uh, some of the things that we learned from um, David Marks, who was on episode four. And, um, uh, and we will be putting this in the show notes so that you'll be able to see how to use Google Earth. And I'm, uh, oops, I'm going right back here. Google Earth, Earth is a standalone app that goes into three dimension. And if you watch David's episode four, he tells you exactly how to do it. And so it's a standalone app that you have to download. But you can put in, like what we've done here, what I've done here, is put Joshua Tree National Park. I was in Palm Springs last spring, and learning from Margaret and Jim and all of our guests how to actually plan a sunrise event. So on Google Earth, and this is an actual shot from Google Earth because it showed me the road I was going to go on and the Joshua trees. I wanted to have that iconic shot of the sun coming up behind the tree with the mountains, the one I saw in the condo we were staying at. And here was another one from actually from Google Earth. So wherever you are in the world, you can actually put the, your location and then down at the bottom, you can track on your phone the coordinates and find that exact spot. So this is the sun. You can track the sun just like uh, Jim was talking about on the Photographer's Ephemeris. But here you can actually put in the date. I made this screenshot on the 6th and that was what the sun coming up um, at uh, 6.13. And then this is what it was going to look like at 6.42. Now again, this is on Google Earth. So no matter where you're going on vacation, you can actually get the 3D look of what, where you're going to be doing your shooting. Now, <clears throat> it only took me about two and a half hours to figure that out the first time. And uh, we were about one hour from Joshua Tree. So I resorted to the regular recon, drive, and find where you want to go in the morning. So this is one of the shots. And when we're stopping here, I have blue hour shots of this exact location. And here was one of the trees that I was like, this, okay, here's one that I want to take. So these are day shots getting prepared for that morning shoot. So we arrived early and uh, we arrived before there was any sun. So as it started to come up, the moon was still there. And as it starts to rise, you can, you can just watch this whole sunrise here through and how the shadow comes up and the shading within the sky is changing. And I know as the newbie to this group, I bring, and hopefully those, those of you who are watching who are new, that you don't just wake up and there's the sun and get that shot. There is a lot to go into planning on how to do it and where you move, like Jim was showing us, moving within the location. And here trying to get different silhouettes, and there we are back to that, this is the blue hour where the sun is behind and just uh, showing the shadow there. And then as the colors start to come up, then I can move around and get the silhouettes that I like within the prism that is making the colors 
for the sunrise or the sunset. And so here it comes back to the tree, and you can see that the, the color is going out of the sky again. And when I just zoomed in on the top where the golden hues were coming, then I could just get the silhouette that I wanted. And there we go. It just keeps, keeps on coming, getting much brighter. And then we come right here. Now all the color's gone from the si sky, and you can see through the shadows, the sun coming through um, the uh, uh, tree there and making shadows on the ground. Do we so. have any um, questions there for you, Cara? This beautiful photo. Thanks. I, I did my practice five minutes, and <laughs> it's like, so here we go. That was it. So. Okay, we're done, and now we're ready to come to Kevin, who is going to share with us sunset planning. Yeah, so, you know, we have this joke, Jim and I, that I think he's crazy <laughs> for getting up so early and never knowing if there's going to be good clouds or, or good sun sunrise or what, but I applaud him, and I applaud all of you who are willing to get up early because I have trouble with it. So anyway, um, the first thing that I'd like to, to talk about is um, I think a lot of the times I, I end up with some, some shots that others aren't, and that's because I'm willing to stay out uh, later, especially when I'm hiking. If I'm up in the mountains, um, I'm not scared to stay up in the dark and... What everyone needs to get is a flashlight. If you have a flashlight, you won't be scared to be out there in the dark. Get a, this is actually a extremely bright flashlight. I got it off of Amazon for $20. Came with two rechargeable batteries and uh, a charger, all for that amount of money. And this light is brighter than this. The new technology with flashlights is amazing. So, um, and I can get a link for that if anyone's interested in that. Oh yeah, that'd be great for the show the show yeah. notes, please. Absolutely. Okay, so here comes my screenshot, and and this is just the first one that I is an example of that. This was at the top of a five mile hike and gaining almost five thousand feet of elevation, and when I got up there, I was so tired, and uh, I. For a minute, I thought, oh, I'm just going to head back down. And uh, I didn't. I forced myself to stay up there till sunset, and I was rewarded. I, <clears throat> I enjoy the shot. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is I kind of break the sunset into two times, and one is before sunset, and that usually is a, an hour before up until sunset. And I, I would say 90% of my shots are actually before sunset. They're, they're like this. Um, and the, the reason I like this is because you can still get your um, sunset colors, especially if there's plenty of clouds. Um, in fact, when I plan to go out on a shoot, um, I usually will go hiking one time a week, and I just look outside and see if there's any clouds. And if there's not, I might choose a different day and hope that there might be clouds that day. But this is, when you have the, the light out, then you're able to get a good foreground and get some interesting things as well as some nice colors. Now this is kind of the opposite. Um, this is, the sun is down. The sun is beyond, behind the horizon there. And that's when you get the most dramatic colors. Um, so another example, this is, about uh, 45 minutes before sunset this was shot and there were still nice colors in the sky. It was very cloudy behind me so it kind of, uh, when there's a lot of clouds your colors come a little little earlier unless there's too many and it's completely blocking the sun of course. But um, So we're able to get these colors yet we're still able to get all the uh, light on the grasses, most importantly the boat here, um, the trees. And this is another example of late in the in the sunset day, you know. And this is good for silhouettes, you, because honestly, this tree that's sitting there isn't interesting. If it was lit up, it wouldn't be that interesting. So a silhouette is actually a nice thing. 
Okay, now I know this isn't a sunset, but I want to kind of describe the way that um, I plan when I get up somewhere to shoot. So this was the hike I did, and I got up to, to this point at about 7 o'clock at night. Sunset was at 8. Um, that's one thing I definitely do check before I go is what time actual sunset is. And so I, I got a couple pictures, and I walked around this area, and I thought this would be a really nice area to be at when the sun sets. So I continued to walk around. I walked quite a ways around taking pictures. At uh, 7.30, I took this photo, and I, I decided, you know, these, these clouds are, are fairly thick, and I think I'm going to have an early sunset. And I want to be back over to where I had planned. So I took off running. And uh, the, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but I was down below this for the shot at 7.30. I took this shot at 8 o'clock. And I did take a couple shots on the way up uh, down here in this field. But I had planned it before to try and get up to this point um, where I could see down onto the sunset and see down onto the lake. And so... I think it's really important that to just get there early and walk around where you plan to shoot and just look and, and look at where the sun's heading and figure out your best composition uh, before the sun sets go, goes because just like Jim said with the sunrise, you need to be ready with your lens, you need to be ready with your camera settings, um, you need to practice so that you do know what camera settings to do quickly so that you can get this shot because that sunset's going to last a couple minutes. Those colors are going to be gone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip that. Um, the, the final thing that I want to talk about is just being ready. Um, having your camera and for me I always have my tripod with me. Um, just driving down the road and came around the corner and saw this so I'm ready. I'm prepared. I have my camera so just pulled over and took this shot. Uh, this is another one that uh, I had no plans to do photography this day. I wasn't planning on taking any pictures, um, but I, I saw this, I grabbed my camera, took the picture, and those colors were gone in about 45 seconds. So, it, you know, you really need to be prepared and be ready to when something like this comes up. Uh, the same with this. This is very close to my house. I was just driving driving around near my house and saw the colors, pulled over and, and got this shot. Um, the rest of these, I'm just going to browse through these real quickly. Um, now this, uh, normally I would make this a complete silhouette for the hiker. And that's my friend that hiked up with me. But the fact that he, for my composition, I couldn't have him standing out uh, clear from that hill, um, all you'd be able to see it was his head if I made a complete silhouette. So I actually just used the shadow slider in Lightroom and brought up the shadows so that you can see him a little bit so it's still somewhat of a silhouette. Um, oh, <laughs> I, there he is. <laughs> I was like, where is he? And then um, I think uh, I'll just end on that and and back to well, you. Well, thank you um, so much, Kevin. Those are very inspiring. <laughs> and now we're off to Jeff, who's going to be talking about um, HD. Okay, let me see if I can get my uh, screen share alive here. Hello. Yep. Are you seeing, or what are you seeing there? Nothing yet. We're seeing you, Jeff. Okay, and uh, this should do it. All right. So um, I've got five minutes for HDR, and HDR, that's like trying to put the ocean in a thimble. And you, can't even get your toe, you can't even get your toe in the thimble. So we'll uh, jump right in here. It looks from what I've seen of the uh, event site that there's a lot of expertise in the uh, group that uh, they the people in this group uh, people have come to landscape photography are pretty familiar with uh, HDR but I've seen quite a bit of that in the um, 
the uh, event for sharing. So I'm just going to uh, skip several steps here and go right into uh, my example and without a lot of uh, history or any of the background of HDR. And we're going to have a program on September 24th that should be able to give us uh, time to stretch out a little bit and actually talk about some of that history and how it's affected the development. But for now, um, we're going to start out with a picture taken from a place called Mendota Bridge. And it was taken at the moment of sunrise on June 19th. And the quick backstory on this was I was scouting a location for the summer solstice to sunrise. And I saw that the uh, Minnesota River ran underneath the, the Mendota Bridge and gave me a clear shot all the way past downtown St. Paul, which is, uh, you can see a little bit of the buildings here, at sunrise. And I wanted to go scope it out, see exactly where the sun came up. So on the 21st, I would be fully prepared. One of the things that has been mentioned is become if very familiar with your equipment, practice, and that becomes a major factor. Sunrises and sunsets, sometimes you have literally seconds to capture something that you want. And if you're fumbling, if you've forgotten something, if, you, if you're not comfortable with your equipment, that becomes an issue. So this is a single shot exposure using averaging meter on the Nikon D700. And it did a valiant effort to try to get the uh, sky, a little bit of detail in the sky, hold some detail in the shadow in the foreground trees, and still catch the reflection. But you can't tell at all what the impression on a viewer on the bridge was from this picture. So you have to resort to some post-processing technology sometimes to really get something that looks like what you intended. And in this HDR version, you get, a, you get the blue of the sky, you get some of the detail in the treetops. And one of the other issues that has come up in this discussion is whether you go to silhouette in sunrise or sunset, or whether you want to bring some of the lighting up in the shadowed areas. And that involves also the issue when you do use Lightroom on a single shot to bring up shadow areas, you are working with very thin data. You have very little information in that file, and you're going to end up with a lot of noise being interpolated into these areas that won't necessarily show up too much on a computer screen, but it's going to show up if you try to make a print or if you zoom in. Uh, that's going to be a problem. So this is the HDR version, and the method of uh, the, the way that the HDR is created is you're taking multiple shots and I'm going to introduce a little bit of science here. Most of you who have SLRs will recognize what is called the histogram. If you can see my arrow here and the histogram is a series of vertical tiny little vertical bars which represents the actual count of pixels in the scene that have that value ranging from dark over on this side to light on this side. This is a series of four exposures that was taken of the same scene on a tripod and the setting of the the aperture was fixed and the speed was set at uh, was allowed to change so that you have four uh, f-stops overexposure gives you a lot of uh, white pixels in the scene. Two f-stops overexposure starts to bring the histogram, the hump of the histogram back into the middle of the scene, but you still have burnout on the wall and in the sky. This is your camera's average setting. This is what the camera sees and wants to take a picture of and what it's capable of taking a picture of, which is usually between 7 and say 10 f-stop range, depending upon whether you're shooting JPEGs or RAW format but you're still getting burnout and you're still getting shadow dropout already in an average photo. You go two more stops down and you're starting to get a lot of uh, loss of detail in the shadow, but you get some of the color on the stucco wall and you go all the way down and what are you getting there? That's a, that's a academic debate. High dynamic range takes these various uh, combined exposures into one 32 bit image that has room for the highest and the lowest values and it performs a 
combination algorithm that will look at each one of these scenes and it will use a measure to determine how uh, much information and what the optimum amount of information is and it will select from any one of these four exposures to combine and, and give you a, uh, a final product that is the picture that you want. So you're taking the darkest picture over here which gives you good exposure on the clouds in the sky the lightest picture where the sky is completely burned out but gives you the properly exposed foreground for a normal exposure but again artistically you don't want that and you don't want that what you want is a, uh, a modified combination of these things in this shot here which uh, starts to look somewhat like a painting so the um, the reason for HDR is because the sensitivity the human eye can see 14 f-stops at once in any given scene and because it has accommodation or adaptation it can go into a dark room and it or go into bright sunlight and it can actually see something like 20 f-stops with adaptation film could only see 8 f-stops the uh, average CCD right up until recently could only see about 8 f-stops now with 14-bit raw files we're starting to be able to get up to 10 and 11 f-stops in a single file but it's the limitations of the sensitivity range in your film uh, sensor that requires if you want to capture those detail and combine them into a single image that you have to use some post-processing and we're something we're calling HDR here. Jeff, so we're a, at seven minutes now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish up then and I'm going to say watch the landscape photography show. Uh, the HDR episode will be September 24th. 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we'll show you how to set up uh, your equipment in the field. We'll talk about software uh, problems and give you some tips and we'll ex work through a couple of examples. So submit your problem or bragging HDR photos before the show. And oh, Jeff. <laughs> this has just been wonderful. I, from the newbie standpoint, it's like I get HDR now. That was the best for me. I, and, hope. Um, I appreciate that. And we have a question from Kai um, on here that says, any tips on what metering mode would work best when dealing with a bright sky and a dark foreground? Well, very quickly, I would just say that um, I rarely use spot metering. Um, I typically will just use average metering, but I, the reason I say that is because of my experience I kind of know what's going to happen with the averaging metering. Go, if you know go back how to, to use, your face, Jeff. We're okay. We're looking at your screen. <laughs> okay. If you know if you know how to use a, a spot meter and you understand something about your optimum or something like the zone system uh, in black and white, what Ansel Adams used, then you can get your seven uh, f-stop range uh, uh, established well with a spot meter, and that's a cool technology to use. When I'm in the field I just use average metering and I've used a little bit of trial and error to to get to the point where uh, I can use uh, averaging metering and I can know whether it's going to be something that I'm secure with. We can go into well, some detail with that at the HDR. Great uh, and sure. Jeff this is Kai. Kai and Jeff you can have an offline conversation. All right. So now we're, we're gonna run over here to uh, Tom and Tom I mean every time I think of you I think of Carmel and I think of oh my gosh what a, what a major wonderful place to live and uh, he's going to put the icing on our cake tonight um, and if you're not following Tom boy you need to be because his shot are incredible. So, the ice our cake, Tom. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Kara. Um, I'm going to cover the use of filters for um, sunrise or sunset. And I think, as Jeff has explained, it's often a challenge because you're looking directly into the sun. So, you either want your sky exposed properly, and then the foreground will be too dark, you'll lose detail. Or if you expose properly for the foreground, you lose all detail in the sky. It looks very washed out. So this is nothing new. Film photographers have dealt with this for years and years, and what they've used are filters. Now, we might be familiar with a, a neutral density filter, and this is a type of filter that is almost think of it as a uh, sunglasses for your, for your camera. It looks uh, gray in color, 
but in fact, it reduces the intensity of the light equally at different colors, at least the good one do. So there's no color tint for the use of these. So this is a standard neutral density filter. They also make a graduated neutral density filter. And I'm not sure how well this, this is coming across here, but it's darker at one edge and then gets lighter towards the center. And this is ideal for when you're doing landscape shots at sunset where you have a bright, bright sky. You can put the dark portion where the sky will be, and that would essentially reduce the exposure, reduce the amount of light coming from the sky. And this is a way to um, get the proper exposure so you can have detail in the foreground as well as detail in the sky by reducing the dynamic range. It's a really a selective filter. Okay, hey, Tom, we're having a hard time with your audio. I wonder if you could just click or get cl maybe closer to the computer. It, it's breaking up. Now, okay. now try. All right, fine. Um, it, it may be just my uh, my computer, but this this is a standard throw-on filter. This is a graduated neutral density. It's darker one edge, so typically you put the dark edge at the top for the side to reduce. Hey, Tom, real quick. Okay. Tom, and sorry. And this is something you can use either for film or or in a digital camera. I think Kevin has a now, suggestion. Yeah, so actually. Here's here. Hey, Tom, I, I think it actually got worse yeah. when you moved closer. I'm wondering, maybe try moving back. It's, it's just breaking if, in out. If everybody else mutes their microphone in case somebody was typing, Tom might have a better shot here. Okay. All right. So he said move back a little and see, uh, Tom. If, okay. Go, now, go ahead. This go is ahead. the shot as, as taken where it was exposed for the four... Perfect. We can hear you now. Okay. This shot was exposed for the foreground, so you see the detail of the boats in the dock. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, the, the sky was a little bit overexposed because it's so bright, and so you lose some of the color and detail in the sky. So what you can do um, is do some processing in, in, in your software. In my case, I use Lightroom, and I can use a, a graduated filter done in my processing. Now I can either have a, you know, graded from the, totally from the top to the bottom, so it's, it's fairly uh, even, linear, or I can have most of the top half dark and just have a very narrow grading area, or if I wanted an angle, I, I have many different ways of doing this. I can I can grade the filter. So I can not only grade the exposure, but I can vary the contrast, the clarity, the highlights, the color saturation. There's an infinite number of combinations you can do, do with this. And so I can take the uh, picture I showed earlier. Um, here I am in Lightroom. Um, this is the develop module. You can do it also in Photoshop or, or other processing programs. Wow. And right, and right now I am grading it's all dark over the top portion and then it's graded over the band. And I've reduced the exposure somewhat. I've re reduced the highlights a little bit. I've increased the saturation. And um, then I will apply this and um, you you'll, you'll see a much more colorful sky, much more detail, uh, less, less um, of the area blowing out. At the same time, because the, the initial exposure was done correctly for the foreground, I, I can um, I can get both. Have my cake, you need it too. So this is just a, a combination. This was the initial exposure, and this is with the addition of the uh, the software uh, graduated neutral density filter. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say. Oh, wow! We are we are just rocking here. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Yeah, and real quick, I want to just make a comment. So on uh, Kai's question about metering, and and this kind of went into what Tom was talking about there. Maybe this would would help. Is I I also just uh, I meter for the entire scene, but. Uh, when I'm shooting a sunset, I shoot bracketed, and typically your your middle 
shot will actually be exposed for the foreground and not the sky. And that, and I think that's fine. And using the what Tom just showed you, 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 you usually can bring back the detail in that um, without it blowing out at sunset and sunrise. Um, so that new that uh, graduated filter that you can just add in any software works really good for that. Yeah. I would like to say that's a wonderful question to ask in this show about sunrise and sunset because what do you take your reading on? That's a, that's the first question you need to ask. Yeah, and, and I'm going to jump in also with just a comment. Um, about 10 years ago when I got my first digital SLR, um, I got lazy and I use histograms. So there's this meter in there and I'm sure I use the meter but you know, like Kevin said, I bracket pretty heavily, but frankly, I rely almost completely on the histogram. The meter gives me a good starting point. The histogram tells me if I want to go up or down, and then I bracket anyway. So join us on the 24th for uh, examples. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's see, I'm over here, and uh, I don't see any more questions on the screen. We've got Kai's, and I want to congratulate us, team. Yes, we stayed on track and on time, and um, I have learned some new things. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jim, uh, Kevin, and uh, Jeff, and Margaret, and it, all of these people. I just want to tell anybody listening. It, it, circle them all, and we have the circles, the photographers to watch, and that's the segment, with sec, segment we are coming to now with the photographers to watch because your stream will be amazingly beautiful when you watch these photographers. So um, who's ready to go? Anybody sat um, here? Let me start. Go ahead. We'll okay. go to Jim, and he'll uh, give us his photographer to watch. So uh, my photographer is Kai Kosonen, and I think I'm probably um, butchering his name. He's going to help me with that later. But uh, you know, he's got uh, he's a serious amateur based in Hawaii, uh, fairly new to photography, but he does amazing work. And you saw one of his shots earlier um, when we opened the the show. Um, and uh, I will say most of the shots in his stream are seascapes, you know, some black and white, a lot of color, um, just beautiful work, and I uh, encourage you to check out his stream and see what you think, and uh, drop him a note and say hi, and if you like what you see, definitely follow him. Oh, that's great. And uh, looks like, Jeff, are you ready? Is that your screenshot ready? Sure. Okay, we're going to Jeff, and he's got his screenshot here. Your do I need to do? Watch. Do I need to do anything else, or can you see this? Well, we can see a lot of small uh, uh, shots, but just tell us your photographer's name. Okay, it's Ki Zeng. I'm going to guess is the oh. pronunciation. K E Z E N G, who used to be a curator for landscape photography, and the reason I chose him is because I would have nothing to do with HDR a year ago. I was too much of a snob and old school with film and, <laughs> and, the, and the real classic background and doing everything the hard way. We love and, how you've changed. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Key has been posting these landscape shots, I mean these uh, seascape uh, sunrises and sunsets from his, uh, I think in San Diego was where he was yeah. doing most of his work. And I was just uh, flabbergasted by the quality and the artistry of them, and I realized that I was missing out on something by uh, being too rigid in my thinking. And so I'm sh I'm going to share uh, Key's work because he was instrumental in inspiring me to go out there and grapple with this and figure out some things and and uh, try to uh, enhance my appreciation of what you can do with photography. So what a great it. story. We, lo we love that story. Thank you, Jeff. Now, Kevin, are we ready to go? Sure am. Great. So, um, you can see that we got a theme here. Uh, I've got my recommended photographer is Mila Reardon, and I really do hope I'm saying her name right. Uh, she's in the UK, but she is, she is the one that we, um, the other photo that we selected from our our theme today and she does a lot of great work so check her out 
Um, looks like she does a lot of really good HDR as well as some natural stuff, and so circle her. Great, great. And Tom, looks like you're ready with your shots. Yes. Yeah, um, I love it when this happens. Everybody get their shots up. <laughs> uh, the photographer I picked this week is uh, Sean Bagshaw. He's based in Ashland, Oregon, and he's just done some wonderful landscape shots. Here we have one of uh, a lake with the snow-covered mountains, with pretty flowers in the foreground. So I, I think this shot's just great. So I would encourage everyone to, to follow Sean. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Margaret. I've got one. Uh, my recommendation is uh, Dave LaFontaine, and he is um, uh, doesn't have very many followers. I think about 5,000 followers, uh, all the people that are uh, following his work, but I just love the uh, beauty that he captures. And um, everyone kind of knows I've got a thing about Yosemite, so I kind of lean to Yosemite anyway. So put a great photographer and Yosemite together, and I just sort of drool all over these pictures. Uh, but this is one um, uh, that he shared recently. Gorgeous mountains. I love the, the reflections in that icy water. You can almost feel how, how cold that it is. And uh, let's see, here is... Let's see, did you see that other one? Not sure it's coming up. There we are. Here's another one. Again, um, uh, just gorgeous uh, reflections. We're on the same one, Margaret. You got it there? No, same one. Okay, let's try this one more time. Well, There's your lovely face. Not, not cooperating. But anyway, that, that's my photographer, Dave LaFontaine. Uh, he's out of Santa uh, Marcos, I believe, San uh, Marcos, California, and just an excellent photographer to follow. Well, thank you. So I'm going to get my screen share here. And um, I'm going to share. Okay. We're going to share um, Mike Berenson, and uh, he um, oh, it was submitted three photographs um, in our event, and um, he is Colorado Captures does events, and he has two events going, um, one in a Rocky Mountain National Park on September 7th to shoot the, the sky and the stars, and also in Moab and um, over Labor Day. So uh, he will be in the um, group of photographers to watch, and thank you so much, um, Mike, for uh, adding to our um, photographer our event and um, so now it's we did it we we stayed on track but I'm so excited I'm sure our viewers are too it's like oh an hour and a half later but we want to invite you back because uh, we have a show schedule now that we've been working and practicing like Kevin said you've got to practice those shots get there early and so we appreciate you hanging in there with us we love the event, and our next um, photographer will be Mark Johnson, and he has been with us before. He is a Photoshop luminary, and he will be on the 27th. Now, please take note. He has a different time frame. It will be... Um, uh, 11 o'clock mountain time and so if you circle our page the landscape photography show and watch for the event because we have decided that it was so much fun meeting all of you and um, talking about the photos that we will have you post your favorite 
photoshopped photo uh, in the event. So, uh, and Mark uh, did post a, a, a photo in our event, which was the sunset on the beach with a door. And so he's going to take that example and show us how to use uh, Photoshop with composites in your landscape photography work. So that's going to be fun. And then after Mark, we will have um, Ray Billcliff, um, and he will be on the 10th of September, then the 24th of September, HDR, and then on the 8th of October, we'll have Jeff Sullivan back with Night Photography. So uh, we're just thrilled that we've got this plan, and we appreciate each and every one of you, and we will be embedding the link for the gallery and this event on this YouTube. So people will be coming to see your photos. So look at the gallery as a learning tool and ask the photographers what they did to create those shots. We've got a lot of great um, conversation going on. And now we have a surprise, our last surprise. Jim? <laughs> Ready? Ready? One, two, two three. three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And we you should keep our you scoundrels. <laughs> <laughs> Conveniently, we don't see Margaret. Yeah, I, yes. I don't know what's wrong with this uh, computer. Well, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate the birthday greetings. Um, uh, my birthday is actually on Thursday, so. Well, we're, awesome. we're early bird. It's a birthday week. You know, when you get uh, a certain time, it's a birthday week. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very no much. Cake. Does that mean we don't get any cake tonight? Oh, <laughs> a virtual cake. I'll, I'll be making one of those. That's the only good. Carla can probably bake. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're gonna sign off. Peace to all of you. And again, oh, sending you kisses. The event was amazing. So join us for our Photoshop event in the next two weeks. It'll be posted tomorrow. And you all have a great evening. I'm gonna sign off now. Thanks, everybody.